Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to our webinar, our debate, I should say, really, on the great B2B experience gap. My name's Theresa Cottam, and I'm the Chief Analyst at Industry Analysts Omniexperience. I'm also a judge for the Gerta Mays Glomo Awards and for the World Communication Awards, and I've worked in the B2B side of the industry for a considerable proportion of my career. We've got some great panellists here today to debate this topic for you. Uh, but before we begin, I thought I'd just go through uh, a little bit of housekeeping. Our session is going to last about an hour, and at the end, we'd like to answer any questions that uh, our audience have for us. So please send those over as you think of them during the session. Um, I will ask, and then I'll ask the, the panellists to, to answer those at the end. There's also going to be a white paper associated with this, so if you'd like to get a copy of that, then uh, by all means, send uh, your details over to uh, Cerulean and they'll make sure that you, you get one in due course. So, with no more ado, let me introduce our fabulous panellists today. Uh, first of all, we have Richard Owen. Richard, can you, can you wave just to show which Richard you are? Um, He's a, a CX thinker, he's been in the CX game for a long time, and he's the founder of OCX Cognition. Could you quickly introduce yourself, please, Richard? Certainly. Well, hello, everybody. So, uh, Richard, I've been in the CX space now for getting on 20 years after a corporate career at uh, Dell Computer. My prior company was a company called Satmetrics. Uh, my team there developed the uh, Net Promoter Score methodology in a joint venture with uh, Bain and & Company, and uh, over the subsequent years, implemented around 1,000 enterprise CX programs. About 6,000 other companies adopted our methodologies and approaches globally. Uh, so most recently, after that company was sold, I founded OCX Cognition, which is really applying machine learning to uh, substantially increase the amount of data companies have from just their survey data sets so that they can really get to a more continuous and complete set of data about customers. So it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Teresa. Great to have you, Richard. And we've also got Vish Patel, who's a great CX champion, latterly with Lumen, uh, the big B2B um, providers, backbone providers, I should say. Vish, great to have you here. Can you give us a little brief introduction to your background? Absolutely. Um, so my name is Vish Patel. I'm the director of customer experience um, within EMEA at Lumen Technologies. Um, so my role is everything you can think of to do with the customer, from the transactions they do all the way to what we're doing with the strategies, segmentation, modeling, all of that stuff, including all the data analysis. Um, and I get very, very involved uh, in innovation as well. So looking outside of our business, um, looking more outside of our industry even to see who are the best how are they doing it? And what can we bring back into Lumen to really innovate in our space? Um, so that's me in a nutshell. So a man from the coal so to speak, of customer experience in our <laughs> industry. And last but not least, we have Richard Dalto, the other Richard uh, from Cerulean Technologies, a great CX fixer, Richard, if I, uh, you don't mind me saying so. Uh, could you briefly introduce yourself? Thanks, Teresa. Richard Doughty. Yeah, I'm the Business Development Director at Cerulean, so I'm eventually responsible for all of our customers, new and, and existing. Uh, 25 years in telco, but always on the vendor side in BSS. So I guess I'm, I'm the poacher on the team here. I have always come from the, uh, the vendor side of the telco world. And within Cerulean, besides looking after new business, I'm very keenly involved in our thought leadership in terms of driving our products forward. Uh, but making sure that's aligned with the vision and direction of our customers. Thanks, Dorit. Thank you very much, Richard. So the great B2B experience gap, what's it all about? So I've lost count of the amount of times and my panelists probably, I think, will nod in agreement, and I'm sure a lot of you too will, that I've heard people say, well, see, actually, that's just consumer. Um, and everybody, when you start talking about some of the CX concepts, immediately believe it's just the consumer side of the business they forget that you know on b2b it's not robots buying things it's still people and they still have an experience and an experience that's increasingly informed by their consumer experience so whether they're buying from amazon or they're buying from you know a b2c side of our business um, those expectations inform what they increasingly expect when they when they put their job hats on and they're in their b2b you know sort of role 
I think it's really important to remember as well that B2B buying has changed a lot. So almost three quarters of the B2B buyers today are now millennials, so relatively young people. Uh, I think of your age group, Vich, if I might say so. And increasingly, you know, the Generation Z people that are coming in, the oldest of which are now about 26, 27. So we're going to see those coming through into our, into our base as well. So these people expect a far more digital experience than, you know, perhaps older uh, buyers, um, you know, would have put up with a, a more manual experience. These people expect digital experience today. And they, they expect it to be very, they don't understand why they have to wait long periods of time for things and they want that instant experience um, that they get on the, on the B2C side. I think also the nature of the game has changed. So, um, you know, whereas we used to sign very long term contracts and we would, you know, tie people up for, you know, years at a time, bit, um, those contract periods have come down. There's a lot more volatility, people want more change, and therefore, we almost have to, you know, keep going back to the, you know, the, the buyers are coming back to us more and more frequently for new products, change, etc. So there's far more touch points there than perhaps they used to be traditionally. And I think the other thing to point out as well, in terms of these gaps is that uh, people tend to think of B2B as just being large enterprise, which is what Lumen's uh, customers um, are, you know, the very biggest enterprises. And we have to remember that B2B is a huge market and it's everything from single person businesses, what we used to call Soho, all the way through to these global enterprises. And that, you know, perhaps the way that these uh, customers are being segmented and supported is actually standing in the way of those, you know, addressing their needs and improving their CX as well. In some ways, I would argue that all customers are becoming B2B because, I mean, think about it at home. You know, so many people now that are running side businesses, um, you know, we've got uh, people that are employed by large companies who are working from home. And so, you know, to some extent, you could say that B2B, we're all B2B now. And therefore, we, you know, this is something that we just can't keep enough um, addressing. So, um, you know, what do B2B customers expect? Well, it's not really so much different to, you know, what we already know that our B2C customers want. Um, you know, in short, they want a more digital experience. They want to save money. Um, very, very importantly, they want to save time because uh, time is very precious to them. And they want to ensure as well that their employees are satisfied so there's a big drive here uh, in b2b around ex employee experience in fact uh, on experience we say ex is the new cx and employees have a lot more um, influence over you know what is bought and whether it's renewed and a lot more say and the, and the budget is much more distributed than it might have been a few years ago so keeping our employees you know happy and making sure that everybody's you know getting what they want has never been more and um, if we get this right, what do we get? Well, according to McKinsey, they say our win rate can go up between 20 and 40 percent. Who, who, who wouldn't like that? Um, we um, can reduce our cost to serve by around 50 percent. And we can also reduce our churn rate by a considerable amount, 10, 15 percent, I reckon. Um, and we're going to hear a bit more about that from Bish and his real life experience, the coalface and what he's been able to do as a result of transforming Lumen's experience as well. But uh, to begin with, um, it would be nice, I think, at this point to ask you, the audience, um, how important you think it is to improve uh, the customer experience in B2B and to close that B2B experience gap. Could we have the, the first poll, please, Dominic? So there you have um, a few questions. I'll give you a mini or two to answer. What do we think, guys? What, what would we be voting for? How important do we think this is to close this experience like that? What do you reckon, Richard Owen? Well, I think that the, I think you know, a lot of people say critically important given the, you know, the nature of the audience we have here today. Um, you know, it's a bit rough if you say I'm here to uh, run CX programs, but I don't think it's very important for the company. Um, you know, I think I think the problem is it's 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 an absolute calibration, and maybe what we should be thinking about is is leadership demonstrating that it's important. Uh, are you getting the buy-in from senior management, 
or is it just something that you believe is important and and ultimately you're not getting a lot of support around? Well, Vish, the good news for you is you've still got a job because no one's saying it's not important. Um, we most people think it's very important to close this gap so that you know you've got some supporters there I'll keep you in a job for a little bit longer, I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, and uh, Richard Doughty, what do you what do you think about these results? We've got people saying critically important or somewhat important you know so if you think it's somewhat important are you slightly miss missing the point or do you think it's because people think that they've got other priorities at the moment well there's always a there's always a range of priorities on there for any business and equally there'll be businesses who are already doing some of this um, from our side uh, for our customers we always look at the, the two sides of it why are we focusing on b2b customer experience it's not solely we're not altruists we're not doing it solely to make people's lives easier or better. We're doing it because it returns the business in different ways. It's a two-edged sword. Driving customer experience, you know, builds loyalty, as the McKinsey survey said, it reduces churn. And I think the most important one, and where a lot of our focus is, is on the cost to serve. You know, almost in a way, and I don't want to sound cynical, but the customer experience can be a beneficial byproduct of other great benefits to surface when we look at the things that deliver it, like automation, like tools and apps and others. Brilliant. So, Vish, let me ask you a question. How big and how bad and how dangerous is this gap? I mean, you know, you came into uh, the Lumens business, um, you know, into this position to head up CX. How important is it to your business to actually, you know, close this gap and make sure that people are getting a good experience? Yeah, so I, th I think for our business and, and, and Lumen in itself is in the technology space, the, the, the dynamics and the demands change so often now, it can change every six months, if you like. We just had a pandemic and that caused another seismic shift in demand. Um, so it's critically important. And it's not just the benefits it delivers just to customers, but it synergizes the whole business. So it synergizes employees because we know there's a link or correlation there between employee experience and customer experience. And likewise, with, with every part of the business, from human-centered design and products, all the way up to how our, our finance teams are working and how our sales and marketing teams work, how they pitch up to customers. So I think it's really just an enabler for the whole business. Um, so experience is critical, not just for customers, but across across the whole kind of piece. And, if you, and if you don't get it right, Bish, I mean... Um, if you don't get it right, yeah, well, this is the problem. If you don't get it right, your retention really suffers, right? And, and loyalty suffers as a result of that. It's, a, it's, I would say in our space, you know, stuff is very, is very dependent on, on pricing and relationships and stuff. So there's a, a balance there. But the one critical thing I've noticed in B2B is if you can maintain that relationship, deliver a good experience, the likelihood is loyalty will, will stay very high. Advocacy is even better. And that will help you to win more customers, but also maintain your customers and get the most out of lifetime uh, value. Yeah, and I think that the B2B market, I mean, perhaps going back a few years was a bit of an oligopoly, but it's becoming increasingly competitive. So, you know, you have to find ways to differentiate uh, and experience is a great one to do that. Richard, how big and bad do you think this is? I mean, you know, these B2B guys have been trailing the consumer side, you know, in your practice. How would you categorize um, performance in this area? I think that was you, Richard. Sorry, Richard Owen. Sorry. <laughs> ah. Well, so so I think I, mean, I agree with everything Vish said. I think it's hard to hard to refute any of those uh, um, observations. M let me take a slightly different tack on it, though. Let me suggest this: that the the real sort of hidden risk that companies run is that the turning circle for them to see impact of their choices is long is quite a long time. So what you're executing on today creates business ripples that shape up over the next one to three years. And that means the companies that aren't executing very well today may not see it in their short term financials. But by the time it becomes apparent that they've lost ground, it, it's very difficult to make that change. It's very difficult to re steer the ship back on the right course. So that gap that exists today in B2B is, is a problem for them because they won't see the impact until it comes down the road. The, the, the second thing I'd say is that the, the gap represents an opportunity for competition to steal a march. So we know in most industries, and B2B is no different, a large percentage of the profits accrue to a very small number of players. So maybe 80% of the profit, you know, 80-20 rule, if you like, uh, is a pretty good guess. And if that's the case, 
there's a chance for innovators and leaders to come in and really take a big chunk of market power, take a big chunk of market profits off the table, or perhaps even more alarmingly, new entrants come into the market. And maybe the, the thing I'll close with is every company that's been disrupted by a new entrant eventually looks back and says, the signs were all there two years ago, three years ago. We didn't take care of our customers. By the time we realized that the competition was afoot, it was too late to do anything about it. Well, the, the great example of that, Richard, is probably, you know, Apple coming into the handset market where, you know, at the time they entered Nokia had got it all, you know, sewn up and they had right. indestructible handsets with massively long battery lives. And, you know, we thought we knew what we were doing. And then along come right. Apple, change a few things. They just made it more usable and more enjoyable. Oh, oh, to use Look, look, you know, it's, it's, it wasn't that long ago when BlackBerry was the absolute default enterprise winner in, in, in the ent you know, enterprise applications of, of technology. And, um, you know, I was involved at the time with BlackBerry. And I can tell you that nobody at BlackBerry thought that Apple represented a challenge because it was a consumer product. And exactly you know, let me give you all these reasons why no one in enterprise, oh, security and functionality, no one's going to use a consumer product. And that's a, a very similar thing is uh, we're all people, you know, those employees are people, the consumers are people on B2B or B2C. Those things that work well on the B2C space are immediately transferable to B2B because you've got the same end user consuming it, whether they're at, at home with the kids or in the office with their colleagues. So we might think there's a barrier there, a line there because of our stacks which Richard Bounty it has to be said reinforced by the likes of you vendors Cerulean um, you know you've created these silos um, but the customer doesn't see silos the customer just sees things that they want so my challenge to you then is if we need to reduce this turning circle that uh, Richard Owens just explained to us what can you vendors do to actually help us um, improve that experience faster well, I, and I agree, um, vendors share some responsibility there. Very often we move in, in lockstep with customer demand, you know, like any supplier in any market, you know, there's an element of thought leadership, but equally we're usually only selling what people want to buy until there's a need, it's hard to get traction. Um, I'd come back to Richard's comment though, which I think was very interesting about the turning circle and the time it takes to adjust. Uh, to deliver that end customer benefit, looking at the BSS stack, it requires changes right the way down. And very often with B2B, more than B2C, it's quite a complicated ecosystem. You know, when you peel back the veneer and you look under the hood, and it's not just products and systems being delivered solely from the operator. With B2B in particular, there's often a wider partner ecosystem in terms of your integration points, your tail resell, the combinations of products that go into a, you know, a corporate or public sector solution. Uh, and that, that has an impact at your, you know, orchestration, your service fulfillment in the OSSI, your, your, you know, BSS catalog, lead opportunity, customer engagement. And so very often the only opportunity you have to wholesale refresh that is when you go into those transformation projects, tinkering around the edges, doesn't deliver the automation and the alignment from customer to service that we're talking about here. So you're really looking you know, at a minimum 12 months, probably more like 18 from conception to execution to affect that change. Okay, so I'd like to ask you, Vish, a little bit about your experience at Lumen. I mean, clearly you have turned that circle because um, you got some great results there at Lumen. Can you share a little bit about that success story and how you went about doing it? Yeah, so I, I joined Lumen about two years ago. Um, and then, you know, when I joined, they, they weren't in a dire state, but it, it could it could have been a lot better. So oh, I, 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 th I think you need a bit more praise <laughs> than that. Yeah, it was <laughs> like a lot of the large B2B service providers. There was a lot of work to do. And we talked about the infrastructure there and the complication. And Lumen is a business that had grown a lot by acquisition. So you, you had a lot of legacy standing in your way i think to actually try to improve things so i i, I think you know don't be too modest there um yeah. you I, had a lot to, to I, do. I guess the bigger the biggest things i had no warning about was one the technology so they had a lot of legacy so their their whole strategy has always been um merge acquire merge acquire merge acquire so there was a lot of, of legacy kind of floating about so that was challenge number one the second one is then the people and um, you know 
previously the roots of the business is, is, is rooted in, in telecoms. So there's a certain stigma, there's a certain type of culture that, that stimulates in that organization. Um, and they were on this brink of a transition because CenturyLink was very prominent in the cloud space. Level three was very prominent in the networking space. So it was that this clash of kind of, of cultures in a sense, but it provided the perfect grounds for opportunity. So, so could I just ask you, did, do, is it that because of people's attitude that they think we just can't do that in telecoms or that doesn't apply to telecoms or what was the, what was the objection there? What was the difficulty? I just, I just think it was an element of resistance to, to change. So they liked yeah. doing things in a certain way. They got used to it and it was just, oh, this, all this new stuff is, is new to us, right? No one's really has taken our hearts and minds from it. So it was kind of that piece where they needed to be a, uh, educated on and, the and the cultural shift is so exactly. hard to do. And, it's one of the hardest things, yeah. And 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 that was a piece that took me, I would say, a good part of the year, right? So starting with the frontline folks and then working my way kind of through the business, that's how I, I managed to kind of weed into there. The first part was all education. The second part was then once I won the hearts and minds of IT, I then kind of sat down and said, "All right, look, this is what we need to do to try and." shift the business in the right direction. And the good thing is they were already kind of thinking about this at the same time. So the two kind of met together, I would say about a year in, and we started to see the benefits then in, um, in, our, in our MPS service and stuff. And then one of the pieces that was missing was um, when we implemented MPS, because they didn't have it before, they used, to, they used to focus on CSAT. It provided a nice kind of, um, a nice uh, approach, i.e. The, the outer loop and closing feedback processes, provide a, a perfect methodology to engage customers on and then it provided like that voice to the customer that the um the business needed both at a relationship level and a, tra and a transactional level so everyone in the business had some form of customer insight available to them and i think that's what really shifted the business once we started to get into that into that process of using the feedback looking at it doing something with it and reaching back out to customers that that resonated with them because actually it, it spoke to them as a brand the, them them recognizing that you're taking the time to read a comment and do something about it means a lot to them the worst thing you can do is ask someone to fill out a survey and not do anything with it because that will just put them off responding the next time and the main piece for us was it wasn't about the score it was about getting the responses through so i focused heavily heavily on response rates and then i got it to a certain stage where it's roughly around 20 30 percent which is very good for our industry it's just um, a balance now of trying to maintain that with the scores. So if you don't mind me asking, where did you start from and where are you currently in terms of saying that promoter score or? So we were, yeah, when I came in, we were around about minus 20 two years ago. Wow. Well, um, that, and that's, and kind of, that's kind of typical for the... the yeah, it was, it was kind of in the space of like, you know, you're laggards, but you're kind of around your, your peers and stuff. And then fast forward to, to now. So just last year, we ran our, our most recent survey. We finished on plus 26.7. So wow. we've actually shifted like a, a massive way, almost an, an uptick of, of 40 points. And the thing is, it hasn't been a steady path, but year on year, we've seen the improvement. So there have been waves where we kind of dropped and, and sometimes we drop response rates, but it's progressively, we've gotten better, better year on year. So we can paint that picture back to customers as well. And they're, they're with us on this journey. And if we don't educate them or tell them what's happening in the business, that's, that's another fault of ours. So part of that is also arming our people with the right marketing information. Marketing information. Right. Yeah. Excellent, Vish. Richard Owen, when you look at the B2B side of the market, you know, are there any bright spots other than, you know, the app you named Lumin? Um, or, and, and how would you suggest that, you know, our B2B service providers go about improving, um, you know, and moving towards, you know, a better experience for their customers? Well, I think, I think it's fascinating hearing, uh, hearing Vish's story here. In some ways, I, I feel like we're hearing about a company embracing innovations that, that have been around a long time. You know, and I think the first thing that pops into your head is why, why is it taking companies so long to get to this point? And you could say, well, it took Lumen a long time because they didn't have Vish. But why does it take companies a long time to actually get there? And I think in telecommunications and B2B, it starts with, a, with, with a fundamental management uh, buy into the whole idea. As you say, the obstacles to be overcome customer experience is a consumer phenomenon, you know, we're, we're basically in telecommunications, especially, I think it's, look, it's all about the network at the end of the day, it's about pricing, a whole bunch of rationalizations that essentially defend an industry structure that, that is no longer current. And so there's this, there's this resistance to moving forward. Now you asked the question, are there, are there bright spots? I think there is a lot of innovation now occurring as a consequence of companies realizing two fundamental truths. 
One is that uh, in their industry, being competitive on features and product and price is required, but wholly insufficient to be, to be successful. I mean, those, those are things you bring into the game. And if you don't have them coming through the door, you're not going to be successful, but it doesn't mean you're going to win. You have to find differential advantage. And that can come from exemplary experience in a certain segment of the marketplace. You don't, don't have to win every segment, but you have to dominate uh, in an advantaged way for an attractive segment of the market, ideally a segment where the profit pool is quite deep, where there's real money to be made. And for those customers, you have to be the number one choice by a mile. And that enables you to defend margins and enables you to grow. And as, as, as Richard mentioned earlier, it also probably has a profound impact on your cost to serve. And, and that means that you get much more profit. And so companies are targeting segments of the marketplace and they're building out extremely effective experiences around it. And, uh, you know, I know we'll probably touch on this later, but some of that comes from radically rethinking the, the data universe. You know, we, we can't be sitting here 20 years later talking about survey response rates and an annual survey. That's, that's a 20 year old technology. That's absolutely remarkable. I, I mean, to some extent, this is the most obsolete approach we aren't survey authors, that's not our job. We're here to create business outcomes through CX transformation. And the survey is kind of the jalopy of the industry. It's, it's the buggy whip. We've sort of exhausted its usefulness, but companies are struggling to move on. So I do think we're entering a new era of data and that new data era is going to separate winners and losers again. And we're gonna see some good innovation around it. And Richard, something no, you and let I me just, let me just put something to you, Richard uh, Doughty. Then, so why would they spend money and create a more digital experience um, when, in fact, they've got an account manager there that can do the job just as well as you know, perhaps one of your systems? I suppose you know, in, in terms of um, what Vish is telling us about cultural change, they're used to having it all done by a man, not a computer. What would you What would you say to that? Well, I'm going to answer that question, but I actually just want to come back to something Richard just mentioned, because this has come up in conversations before. With the, with the survey approach, we're answering the feedback of the minority of customers. The success rates of 20 to 30% are laudable and high in the industry. But what that means is we're only acting on the feedback from a, a tiny subset of the customer base. We're taking those business change decisions based on the vocal angry ones and not the silent majority. I wanted to make it sound too political. So when Richard talks about, you know, the surveys being one tool, and I think they're definitely not the most effective one. There's, there's got to be a way to get to the rest of those customers from whom we don't hear. And, and Richard, don't don't forget that it's also they're also obsolete. They're six months old or nine months old data. So not just yeah. a vocal minority, but a but a dated vocal minority. Yeah, yeah and, I, and I don't really care what somebody else thinks, you know, because this is the era of personalization. I want what I oh. need. So, so it's so let, about me, the majority. Let, me and, let me try and draw those threads together. How do we get current data and how do we act on it now? Um, I, I think there's a number of ways. Um, I'm going to unashamedly beat the, the sweet vendor drum to start with to say that bringing together the data that we capture into one place, both in terms of the systems from which we collect it and then the systems in which we view it is very important. When you've got siloed applications which are being worked on individually with their own teams and they lack their collective strategy, we're immediately heading off in the wrong direction. Um, when, you're, when you're looking at a single suite from lead through to service fulfillment that collates that information in one place and gives you, you know, a, an unbroken view of the customer's journey, you're, you're immediately in a better starting position. But Richard, I'm going to bring you back to this idea of people again, which is so much of the experience is I'm like created by the people. And Absolutely. a lot of these processes are stitched together by people. Absolutely. Um, you know, so, and, so it's in, and it's in the salesman head, not in the data that in these systems. But, and, but this is about more frequent touch points and about current data. And, and how do we get that instead of relying on six month old surveys from 20% of the people? is from what we we have been calling things like KCIs and customer touch points, the key customer informed and customer touch points. And the best way to get that is through automation. And what we're thinking about and talking about is taking those tools which have worked well in consumer, such as mobile apps and digital assistants, 
So you're constantly collecting data and getting customer feedback in a far less obtrusive way. You know, people I speak personally, but we almost resent filling in the survey after the fact. When you're talking with a digital assistant during the service fulfillment about, you know, completing complex orders or engineering coming to site or the fulfillment of a you know, wide area network and you're providing data into that process, customers are very, very happy to do it. They're delighted to do it. And if they can do it through an automated tool, which is slick and sleek and efficient and unobtrusive, you know, they can, they, they can do it on an app from the office, uh, the company office or from the bathrooms on a break, you know, they, literally they can do those things. Um, you're getting real time data. You're f instantly feeding it into the analytics. And then as Vish was saying, you're, you're able to act on that very quickly. Um, okay, so but I'm going to bring Vish back into this. Vish, is this Star Wars? I mean, this all sounds wonderful, <laughs> but is it practical for a large B2B service provider like yours? I mean, how do you move your experience forward? I mean, is any of this on your horizon or are you, are you still trying to do far more simple things? No, so we've shifted. So I guess getting the responses to the survey was a big part of it to harmonize the business, right? To, to, to show them that this is the power of insight. We've gone a step further now into say that, I mean, drawing on both, both of the richest points, we've now looked at data from across the business. So we've combined that with operational data. We've combined that with employee data. But if you're thinking about it from a customer's perspective, we just implemented a customer success model. And part of that was using automation and all these different data points to work out a customer health score. But we sat down with our customers and said, what do you think? Uh, you know what resonates most to you so all of the metrics that we use to work out that health score they're all outcome focused so you'll see a lot of these metrics being made up by the business and often if the health score is good it could be from the business's perspective not from the customers so one of the things that we're using is that health score as a, a real-time kind of indicator of where the customer health is and it, it takes into consideration everything from where they've where they've been on our website to look at something to their recent bill where they got double charged or a recent outage or a renewal coming up. So it's kind of like a nice tool to now take that next stage in terms of enabling our people to help manage a customer success. So it's less focused on that one-to-one -one type of approach. Anyone can see that dashboard, but it uses an ad hocacy approach. So it's like a team of teams, if you like. So did you, did you find it easy to put a business code together for, um, you know, these improvements? I mean, how, how easy, how, what tips would you have for the service providers that say, you know, yeah, it sounds great, uh, Fish, but we, I just can't get enough momentum for change within the business. So what, what we did is, well, I guess, uh, no, the business case was, was not easy at all. Um, but uh, well, what we did is we modelled, OK, if we were to carry on as a business running today, despite all this stuff, where would we be in the next three years? And then we looked at so if, that, if we were to do stuff a bit more proactively and actually we engage customers on focusing more retention rather than new sales, this is what could happen. This is the investment that's required, but actually this is the outcome. If we lost, you know, X amount of these customers because of what they're experiencing now, then, you know, the, the benefits out, outweighed the kind of our current state, basically. And that's what really hit home. It was the risk, the, the churn risk, essentially, that really drove home that point around the business case. So then I was able to get the signing, um, the signing off for Gainsight and the customer success model approach. And actually the, the benefit of all of that was we bring in McKinsey. McKinsey worked with the US. They worked with us, and we we basically implemented that model with a specific methodology. And then we we haven't looked back, and we've yet to see kind of um, the increase like year on year. I think it's in March where it would be a full year on year, but it looks promising right now. So we we would definitely retain more customers. I think our retention rate is somewhere is somewhere in the range of ninety five percent. So that already is astonishing from it being in like the eighties before. So it's had a knock on effect on that sense. And if you can maintain that revenue, your new acquisitions are just going to add on top of that. Well, that's one of the biggest challenges in B2B now is it's hard to maintain revenue. Every industry is really struggling. So it's it's that's probably top of mind alongside CX right now. Um, and Richard Owen, what would you advise in terms of how to make a business case for all of this good stuff? Um, what really um, gets these kind of projects going in your experience? Well, look, I think I, I think Vish made a couple of really important points there, and I, I want to revert back to one of his earlier points, but specifically on the business case. Uh, <clears throat> at the end of the day, it, it always comes back down to lifetime value economics of some form, right? So, so com companies are asking, can you impact churn? 
Can you give us uh, indications that we're going to see uh, lower cost to serve, as, as Richard mentioned earlier? Um, and, and the numbers are so big. So you look at a company like Luna, where, where, where Vish is, marginal improvements in any of those numbers are worth an absolute fortune. So to some extent, I always find it a little bit disingenuous when people say, well, we're looking for an ROI on this. If you thought that what you're doing could in any way meaningfully impact cost to serve or retention, the economics are, are, are a no brainer. You're just not going to spend that much money to not have that input. So I think the business case sometimes is more philosophical. You know, if management doesn't believe that these kind of initiatives are going to impact retention, they won't invest in them and you can run the math all you want. If they believe there's a direct linkage between improving experience execution, retention churn, then it's a, it's a mathematical no brainer. But let me draw attention to something else Vish mentioned earlier, which I thought shouldn't go and un, un, un passed by the, by the audience here. Building a health index of any kind, it's great. Everyone, everyone has now their KPIs or their CPIs, however you want to refer it. What he said that was most important is that this, this index is actually calibrated and organized from a customer perspective. So the metrics actually line up with what customers care about. Because unfortunately, too many key performance indicators today are very, virtually self-dealing from the company. They're literally saying, these are things we'd like to focus on because we know we can do them or things we already think we're good at. And they're surprised that improving the KPIs don't have an impact. And so what Vish is talking about, I think, is, is where companies need to go, the calibrated health index scorecard um, that enables them to make sure they're driving their organization to, to outcomes that matter to customers. Excellent. Richard, what do you think the biggest blockers to change are? You know, um, Richard Owen talks about people and cultural change and vicious orders that, you know, part of it's the systems and part of it's the people and inspiring them to change. What What's your view? How do, how do we get these projects going? What do you think the biggest blockers are to actually make change here? Funding's got to be a big one, certainly. Building the business case is, is critical. Um, the hearts and minds inside the business, as well as the raw numbers for us. And we help often our customers do this. You could argue we're trying to help them justify spending the money with us, but equally it's driving the outcomes for them. And I'll come back to something I touched on at the start, which is it, it's, it's, a, it's a gift with many sides. Yes, you get the benefits to the customer, which reduces churn and increases loyalty if you can reduce the cost to serve you've also got the option of opening up new addressable markets so for example you know if you're a classic um, large enterprise and public sector operator who hasn't looked at the sme soho market because you're you know you're just not geared up to do that if you automate and reduce the cost to serve you can bring your price point down to open up new addressable markets and that's a that's a lost opportunity cost, which often doesn't feature in business cases. You know, people focus on what they do today. How do we do today better and not looking actually about widening that lens? You know? So the lost opportunity is a big part in building the business case. Um, you also then increase the efficiency internally. Part of the opportunity, the, the cost to serve, but bringing the data points from the customer of their regular engagement helps drive the analytics that Vish was talking about, which then feeds into those, those outcome-focused KPIs. Uh, and when I'm talking about increasing the touch points, again, it comes back to not just surveying once every three months or once every six months or at the end of a process, you know, an installation process, a new sell process or a recontracting process, but touch point through things like rolling out mobile apps, which incentivize users to interact with them. And that then comes back to something else Vish was talking about, about tracking what customers like. As soon as you move them into those automated processes, the number of data points the customer generates increases exponentially. Now, you've got the risk there of drowning in data. You have to focus on what's important. But the things you can measure on go up logarithmically. Right. Well, OK, so I'd like to sort of focus on this idea of how we fix things a little bit. And there's a long standing panel game on Radio 4 in uh, in the UK 
uh, called Just a Minute, mm -hmm. where uh, competitors are asked to speak without hesitation, deviation or repetition, <laughs> which I think is challenging, but it's going to be particularly challenging for our panellists. Um, and it's a notoriously difficult thing to do. What I'd like the panellists to do is tell us in just a minute um, what their best advice is to try to improve um, the customer experience and to close this gap between expectations and what we're delivering. Um, I'll give you a couple of minutes to think about that, guys, so that you're not repeating yourselves. Um, but while I'm doing that, maybe I could ask you, the audience, uh, what do you think the priority will be for CX initiatives in the next 24 months? And if you could send over uh, your ideas in the chat section, that would be really interesting to hear. So what do you think the priority should be uh, for CX initiatives uh, in the next couple of years? I can also remind you that at the end of this session, we're going to answer your questions. So if you do have any, and if some have come up during the session, then please also send those over. So who am I going to start with? I think, Vish, you have to be my first victim. So let's start with you. Um, in just a minute, can you tell us how do you fix B2B CX and the B2B experience gap when you're ready? OK, so the easiest way to fix the gap from my perspective would be to focus on probably two things. The first thing is to make sure you steal ideas from your competitors or outside of outside of your industry. Some of the things that are doing are great. And if you apply that in your own organization and you fail fast, it's fine. But there's a massive chance that it can be a success and you can expand it and flow on from that. The second part is definitely um, try to invest in digital technologies. The more you can invest to make it easier for your customers to have a simpler experience and a quicker one will have massive, massive advantages for your customer base and for your employees as well to make everyone's life a lot simpler. There you go. Great advice there from Vish. Thank you very much, Vish. Right, Richard Owen, how do we fix the B2B great experience gap? Your minute starts now. Well, rather like Vish, I'm going to focus on two things here. And the first one is about data assets. And I think it's been a theme that's been recurring through everything we've talked about. How do you build the kind of high quality data assets that you can then sweat to make decisions, both at a tactical level, right down to the account level, and also a strategic level for your business? How are you going to organize your expenses? Where are you going to focus and make your investments? And that means getting away, as I said, from this traditional view that says we and CX are in the survey business. And as Richard mentioned earlier, we're actually in the digital data business. We're creating these exhausts where we track customers through our entire universe. We want to process that information, organize it, draw conclusions from it, build the dashboards that Vish talked about earlier, calibrate KPIs, focus the organization. And that sounds like a lot, but at the end of the day, it's going to become table stakes for competition. The second area is how do we engage our organizations? Now, if you have great data, you're more likely to engage your organization, period. Organizational engagement gets crushed when you've got once a year survey data and you have this big hoopla and then it all sort of dies off anyway. But if you've got that data, it's relevant to employees. They can use it to make better decisions. They can use it to help their accounts. They can use it to collaborate across multiple functions because they're all seeing a common view of the customer. Then the employee engagement improves. And by that mechanism, we really get some change. And last but not least, Richard Doughty, um, how are we going to fix the act in 2022? Your minute starts now. No, thank you, Teresa. I'll procrastinate for as long as possible to use up my time, but then I'll speed up. Automation has to be the single biggest way to address that gap. Automation through, I'm repeating myself already, through a single stack from a pre-integrated suite, and that brings five benefits. The first is the self-serve through mobile apps, digital assistance, and B2B care portals, which genuinely look like they care. The second then is the competitive advantage that those bring. If you differentiate on customer experience, you do reduce churn, you can open up new markets, and you can bring customers in that you might not have before. The third is scale. With uh, automatically deployed systems, you then have the ability to increase volumes very easily without additional manual processes and workarounds. And then the efficiency. 80% of end-to-end -end customer processes, new sales, upgrades, retentions, complaints, should be handled automatically with no human intervention. And that reduces the cost of the business. 
And the last point is the data, always coming back to datum. You need that to understand the customers and the business and to feed back into that loop to constantly adjust and refine. Excellent. So, yes, not, not too bad on time, I think. So, I um, say, I'm you, you, you made that out to be such a challenge. And I have to say, I think, uh, you know, if that was a competition, I think the three of us uh, pretty much stuck the landing there for the 60 seconds. I, <laughs> I think one of the uh, problems with CX, from my point of view, is that it is such a big topic. And I think, you know, when people say, how do I start? Um, you know, addressing CX, how do I improve it? It's just this enormous thing. And it's just, where do you, where do you start chipping at, away at it? And there is no really right answer because um, every business is different. So, you know, Vicious had a great go at uh, improving experience at Lumen, but had he joined another large B2B service provider, he might, you know, he might have approached it slightly differently because every backend system infrastructure is different. I would Can I add a comment to that, Teresa? So I, I think one of the things you see as a theme here, and I think Richard talks about it and Vish said the same thing, is that how do you get started? Well, you start by recognizing that this is going to be a multi-period journey of continuous improvement and iteration. And, you know, it's going to take a while and you're going to have to think in terms of staying with it and continuously improving because you can't suddenly create a world-class program. And I think Vish was illustrating that it took, it took him a while, I think, to get going. And that sounds like a very fast progress. But what I, what I was going to say, Richard, is that the common thing, going back to something that you said in the middle of, you know, all your advice there, Vish, was really, it starts and ends with the customer. So the techniques that we use, the processes might be different, the infrastructure might be different. But, you know, to make this work, you really have to focus on what do those customers need from you today? It's as simple as that. It's not that, simple, but that is the, the simple concept. Yeah. And that's a good place to start. Sorry, Vish. No, so, uh, I was just going to say, you know, at the end of the day, they're people. I think people forget customers all this, this scary person. It's a person. And I think that's the incredible part of it. Go out and speak to them. They are not afraid to, to speak to you, right? So part of speaking to the customers massively helped us because as much as we read stuff, Going out and talking to them, seeing their body language, seeing just seeing them in person provides so much more insight than just kind of a, a sheet, an Excel sheet with with comments and stuff on it or, or data. So I've got a question now for our audience to see whether they've been convinced by what you guys have, have been telling them today. So I'd like to ask uh, the audience, um, you know, have the panelists convinced you? Will you be investing in improving your B2B experience? You've told us that it's critically important. But will you actually be doing something about it and spend putting your money where your mouth is, I suppose, in the next 24 months? So can we have the next poll, please? Um, yes, I will be doing something about it or, you know, no, I'm just going to sit on my hands and wait for uh, the competition to obsolete me. I'm probably not an option, I don't think. We'll see. And while we're doing that, we're waiting for the results to come in. Maybe I could uh, start with Richard Owen and say, uh, you know, briefly, Richard, what does success look like? You know, how should I know that I'm on the right track? You know, Richard's book thought there about some really uh, impressive stats that uh, Lumen has managed to turn um, MPS scores around hugely. But, you know, can you give us some, some idea of what success looks like? Right. So, so I think, uh, you know, on one level, uh, as Vish said, it's about the numbers and it's about the financial performance and seeing cost to serve, seeing churn rates, et cetera, improve. But let me give you an alternative perspective on all that. It's about creating a sustainable capacity to execute across your company so that your company is capable of continuously evolving to meet the needs of the market, continuously evolving in the face of competition, we don't know, we didn't know two years ago, we're gonna have a pandemic. We don't know a year from now what the challenge is gonna be, what the competitors are gonna be. So you have to build the muscle to be able to compete. Once you have that, you can face down just about any, any challenge you have coming. Excellent. And Vish, what, you know, obviously that impressive turnaround there in MPS, what, what else can you advise us in terms of what success looks like for you? Yeah, I mean, look, success means different things to, to different organizations, different people. Um, for our business, for sure, it, it's massively switched, right? It, it's focused on, on the numbers, but 
focus more on retaining customers, right? Because the more we can retain our customers, the better just for the organization and for us as a, as a business, because we get to improve the lifetime value of those customers. Um, but we're looking at just more broader than just customer experience, right? We're looking at it from a reputation standpoint, from sustainability standpoint, environmental and social. So I think experience now has just grown so much larger that you have to, often have to take it in components. So we're hitting the numbers. We're starting to make progress on the financials. We now need to focus more on the on the sustainable aspect of it. What are we doing around social impact? What are we doing around environmental sustainability? Because that's the next piece we're seeing in RFPs and tenders from our customers. So Richard Doughty, I've got some really good news for you. According to our poll, um, the majority of people say they are going to invest in customer experience in the next 24 months. So I, I bet you're pretty pleased about that. Uh, uh, well, absolutely. Unsurprised, maybe. Unsurprised, maybe. But please. Something that will be interesting, and I've got ties to a comment I was going to make a moment ago about you know, how we affect customer experience changes. In the digital transformation projects we do, we've seen a knock on from a functional move to agile in these transformation projects which has lost the outcome based focus you know which is part of the cx if you like it's like it's equivalent to you know having your eyes on the ground to look for the holes you're about to walk in compared to having your eyes on the horizon to make sure you're going in the right direction and this is something we're trying to drive and need our customers to help drive when we go into these lengthy transformation projects to achieve automation and get the goal that we actually get involvement from those CX teams at the start to make sure when we're doing the epics and the user stories and we're looking at the detail, you've got those outcome focused targets constantly in mind. Excellent. So I think we have got some questions that have come through. Um, let's have a look at a few of those and uh, put you on the spot a little bit. Um, is the problem that people still think customer experience is just to do with customer service? Oh, Richard, I think, you know, this is one for you, Richard Owen, because you're quite passionate about this. It's not just customer service, is it? <clears throat> well, I, I think it's it's not just, not only is it not just customer service, but customer service runs the risk of being entirely hygienic. By that, I mean, what the data tells us is that once you receive a certain level of customer service, customers no longer care about it. And so customer service typically shows up very high in customer experience data only when it's mis-executed. But, you know, you, you, you see this a lot. You see companies reporting 80-point uh, NPSs or 90-point NPSs. When you ask them how they're measuring it, they say, well, we're just asking customers about our service experience. And, and that should tell you that you're not properly even thinking about what customer experience is. So I think equating customer service with customer experience is is a fundamental misunderstanding of how customers think about your business. They're looking at the entire end-to-end -end experience. Right. I've got a question here for Vish. So, Vish, uh, another question comes through. What resources are out there to help to telcos think in a more CX-centric kind of way? Do you, do you, what, what have you used? What have you benefited from? Uh, so, uh, so, a good book, very, very good book to read is by Nick Meta, uh, Customer Success. So definitely had a read of it because it talks about how the software world has really taken this, this dynamic approach to looking at things, but actually the application of it is now swiftly moving on to every single business you can think about. Startups are basically born like that. So have a read of the customer success book by Nick Mel. It's a very, very good resource. Uh, and Vish, page... is, Vish isn't getting a kickback from Amazon for recommending. No, no, <laughs> no, I'm not. Um, and then there's um, two key articles. Uh, one was about one was from Forbes. It's a it's around like solution selling is gone, and it's all about insights. Um, and we talked about data and insight today quite heavily, right? But customers are looking for insight. They're looking for strategic advice on their technology roadmap, on on their product roadmap. They they're not the experts, and it's very costly to hire someone who's a techn technology expert in your business. So they're leaning on 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 vendors and other companies to actually provide this insight, so they can make better informed decisions from the data that they get. So that's another good resource, um, but I think it's called Insight Selling um, on Forbes. And it is a very good article by Harvard Business Review and Corporate Executive Board. Um, they talked about kind of the seismic shift in, 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 in customer demands, basically, across every industry. Um, and basically, they talk about the fact that customers are going to invest more in 
cloud technologies now because of what happened with the pandemic. So UCC and edge services, uh, SASE will be top of mind from our product perspective um, in kind of our technology space in the next couple of years. And, and I do have to do a little uh, sort of bit promotion here for, for Richard Owen, you know, get in touch with Richard's business, OCX uh, Cognition, you know, I'm sure they can give you lots of great advice Thank as well, you. guys. Uh, and Richard Doughty, I've got a question for you come through. You vendors have created all these silos. Um, how, what do we do to free ourselves up from the silos and and, and create a more perhaps convergent, you know, uh, kind of experience? Well, that's a, that's an easy one. Uh, an end-to-end pre-integrated suite, which comes with standards-based touch points that you can plug in those external systems that make up the periphery. But when you don't have to worry that your automation is hampered by crossing different functional domains, you're starting from such a better place right from the get go. Excellent. Right. We're coming towards the end of our time. So thank you uh, very much for coming to our session. And we hope that we've given you some ideas that you can take back to your business. You know, I've got to call time on these guys because they could talk all day on it. And I'm sure that they'd love to talk to you more about this uh, this topic. I believe that Cerulean is going to be at Mobile World Congress. And I understand yeah. that Hall 7 stand 7B61. So if you are, <laughs> please go along and say hi to Richard Doughty. Uh, and I'm sure that, uh, that, that Richard Owen as well would be happy to answer some more of your questions on how you can improve your B2B CX if you want to get in touch with him. Uh, there will be a recording of this if you'd like to listen to it again. And there's also a white paper that's going to come out, as I mentioned at the beginning. So if you'd like to get a copy of the white paper, then please drop us a line and we'll make sure that you get get one so from all of us thank you very much for attending and we hope we gave you some some ideas uh, and we look forward to to talking to you again about how to improve b2b customer experience mm -hmm.